you can, okay. I'm going to ask you, if you don't mind, it might be helpful today, if you have your Bibles with you, maybe just have them open at that passage, uh, John chapter 14. We're going to be kind of uh, getting getting into the text quite a lot and referencing it a few times. So I think it might be helpful just if you have John chapter 14 uh, somewhere on your phone or if you have your hard copy of your Bible, open that up because we're going to reference it a few times. So we find ourselves in the season of Easter and I, I hear that that's what we've all, uh, you guys have been talking about over the last few weeks with uh, Pastor Shane. Is that right? You've been uh, not just having one sermon about Easter, but kind of keeping the theme going as we look forward to the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, as we look forward to the day of Pentecost. So the kind of big theme that we've been talking about in the past few weeks is Easter. So everything we're going through now is related to the resurrection. And what I kind of want to start by saying is it's no good if the resurrection is just a historical event that happened 2,000 years ago. It's no good if the resurrection is just a fancy miracle that happened once a long time ago. What we as a church need to be thinking about every day is what does the resurrection mean now? What does the resurrection mean today for you and for me? And so I want to kind of start the sermon today by asking you a very serious question and you don't have to answer but just um you don't have to answer out loud but just just think about this in your own mind do you feel the spirit of god flowing within you do you experience the divine love working inside you transforming you changing your life now John, the Gospel of John, chapters 14 through 17. These chapters are known as the farewell discourse. This is basically three chapters dedicated to Jesus giving his final speech, a farewell speech to the disciples before he has to go and be back with the Father again. So, of course, Jesus is talking about his imminent crucifixion, his resurrection, and then his ascension to heaven. Now, if you didn't know this, this is Jesus' longest speech in the entire New Testament. It's a three-chapter speech, as I said, known as the farewell discourse. In other words, if this is the longest uh, speech Jesus has to say, I think that gives us a clue as to, you know, this is basically saying, this is something really important. Whatever Jesus says in these chapters is something that we've really got to take very, very seriously. Now, Jesus knows that his departure is going to cause a lot of spiritual unrest. So he reassures the disciples and says to them, as we read, don't let your hearts be troubled. I'm going to prepare a place for you. One day I'm going to come back. I'm going to take you with me to the same place that I'm going. Now, now is not the time for us to get into a long-winded uh, discussion about exactly what heaven is, but I do want to remind us today of our ultimate destiny. Uh, if, if we had to sum up Christianity in one sentence, I think it would be something like this. Christ becomes human to unite our nature with God's. So I'm going to be very bold now and tell you the goal of your life. Okay, the goal of your life isn't to be rich and successful. The goal of your life isn't to have the perfect career. The goal of your life isn't even to have a wonderful, happy marriage and a family, even though those are all good things. The goal of your life is that sin will die in you and you will become a participant in the divine nature. It is not, this is not a, a simile or a metaphor. This is very true. The goal of your life is that you become a spiritual being. Big words. The goal of your life is that you become a saint. Now, as we... Read on in the passage, we have 
uh, Thomas, he's the intellectual guy, right? Thomas is the guy who has the doubts, wants to know things. And he says to Jesus, well, Jesus, where are you going? And how do we get there? And Jesus says, well, there is a way for you to join me. And then, then Jesus makes this very, very lofty claim. And Jesus says, and you have, to, you have to understand, this would have struck anyone who was hearing this in, in this time, and even now, this would have struck people as being, in a way, rather egotistical, rather arrogant. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father, no one gets to God, except through me. You only get access to God by living in me. You guys have to understand, Jesus is making a claim here that no other religious leader ever did or ever has since. You see, all other religions, all other philosoph philosophers, they all simply point the way to God. Moses, for example, preaches about the way to get to God, you know, by things like the law and the commandments. Priests in the Old Testament talk about what you need to do to get to God, about a path to God. Kings talk about a way to get to God. Prophets talk about what sorts of things you have to do in order to get to God. Even other religions talk about a way to get to God. You know, think about the Buddha telling you what you have to do to get enlightenment. Think about Muhammad saying what you have to do to get to Allah. You see, if Jesus had just said, well, just follow my teachings, then nothing actually about him would have been particularly important. Someone else could have just simply taught the same lesson. Jesus could have just written the words down, handed a book, a, a guidebook to the disciples and said, here you go, now you know the truth, now go and get on with it. But what makes Jesus totally unique is that he points to himself as the vehicle through which one gets to God. He says, you can get to God only through me. That is why Jesus does not say, this is the way, the truth, and the life. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. It is the person of Jesus that saves us, not his teachings. In philosophy, we might say this is Jesus' ontology. It is Jesus' ontology that is more important than his historicity. In other words, it is about who Jesus is in his very person, rather than what he says or does. Is this an extreme thing for Jesus to say? You betcha. Is it bold? Yes. Is it exclusive? Yes. Now, you know, in the culture we live in today, it's very, it's very unpopular, isn't it, to sort of claim that one religion is better than any others. We like to say, or at least you hear people say all the time, all religions are basically the same. All religious paths ultimately lead us to God. But no, if Christ is the way, it simply cannot be true that all paths lead to God. Now, this doesn't mean that other uh, people in other religions, it doesn't mean that they won't be saved, but it does mean that they will still only be saved through Jesus Christ, whether they know it or not. Um, I was recently, I went to a, a private retreat in a monastery in Santa Barbara just for three nights, and it was really really interesting place and I met a lot of different people from various denominations there. We would pray together, have uh, services together, have quiet times together, have, have lunch together. And on my last day, I met this one lady uh, from a, I don't know if you've heard of this church, it's quite a mouthful, but this lady, uh, as we were talking, she said that she was a member of the Women's Unitarian Universalist Church. 
And so I asked her, well, what, what sorts of things do you guys believe? Um, what does your servi lo uh, service look like? Uh, who do you worship? Tell me a little bit about this women's Unitarian Universalist church. And she said, well, we just basically believe that everyone's beautiful and we should accept everyone exactly as they are. Now, I thought that, well, that's, that's interesting. There's something good about that, I think, but maybe something that strikes me as a, a little strange as well. So I sort of, I went home and a couple of days later, I looked up this church on, on, on my uh, laptop and this is what under their, um, you know, uh, what we believe on the first page of their, of their website, this is what they said. And I just want you to, no judgment here, but just uh, what, do you, what do you guys think about, about what this church believes? Here's what it says on the website. We need not think alike to love alike. We are people of many beliefs and backgrounds. People with a religious background, people with none. People who believe in a God, people who don't. People who let the mystery be. We are Unitarian Universalist and Buddhist, Christian, Hindu, Humanist, Jewish, Muslim, Pagan, Atheist, and Agnostic believers in God, and more. What do you guys think about that? I mean, I, as I read that, there's something in there that I kind of appreciate. I appreciate some good instincts there, and I appreciate the desire for love and inclusivity. But the way I see it is, in the end, if you really, really love someone, wouldn't you want to lead them to the truth? And not just say that, well, all things are true. No, if you really love someone, you lead them to what is actually true. And surely not all of those religions on that list can be true. And Jesus, of course, knows this. And so he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Later on, Philip says, well, show us the Father. Show us the Father and we'll be satisfied. And Jesus boldly, again, boldly responds. And by the way, people who say that Jesus doesn't claim to be divine clearly have not read this passage. Jesus says, if you've seen me, you've seen God. If you've seen me, you've seen God. Because I am in the Father and the Father is in me. You want full access to God? You want the divine life flowing inside of you. You want God leading you, his spirit guiding you, conforming your will to his every day. Well, the only one who makes that possible is Jesus Christ, the word made flesh, fully human and fully divine. When we know him, we know God. I promised myself that Every sermon I preach from now on has to have a missional aspect to it. Does that make sense? A sermon, at least the goal of a sermon, should always be to send you guys out to do something. If we're just informing you, we're not doing our job properly because we have to inform you, but we have to transform you and send you out into the world, your mission field, to transform other people. And as I thought about this new kind of uh, standard I wanted to set for myself in every sermon I preach about sending you guys out, I read this passage and I thought, oh my goodness, today's uh, scripture is perfect for that. Because at the end of this small speech from Jesus, in this shocking turn, Jesus says, and this is, this is, this is a huge thing, guys. Jesus says, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do. And in fact, do greater works than these because I'm going to the Father. Really? So Jesus says, you are going to do greater things than I've done. But actually, he's right. I mean, think about it. In Jesus's life, how many people do you think he healed? We probably have stories of maybe 
I don't know, 20, 25 healings. Let's say Jesus, with all the stuff that isn't included in the New Testament, let's say Jesus healed in his life a thousand people. Well, how many people have been healed by doctors and nurses and churches? How many people have been healed by saints in the last 2,000 years? More, more than a thousand, I would say. Jesus spent hours alone in prayer and contemplation with God. But since Jesus, tens of thousands of monasteries have been built and probably millions of, monk, of monks have prayed and contemplated. Way more than Jesus did. Jesus walked around first century Palestine, preached to maybe, I don't know, let's say he preached to 10,000 people, 20,000 people. But how many more people have been preached to since Jesus, since we've had transport, since we've had the internet, since we've had television evangelists? Jesus was totally accurate when he predicted that we would do many more works than he did. So now you might be thinking, well, so who's really the one doing the work? Who is more effective? Is this us against Jesus? No, 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 of course not. Because we are not meant to see this in a, we're not meant to see this in a competitive way. This is not us versus Jesus. Guys, this makes sense because the church is Christ's body. Our work is the continuing work of Jesus. We are the visible representation of the invisible Christ. That is what we mean when we say that we are his mystical body, an interdependent community of members with Christ as our head. So that responsibility should sober you up. That responsibility should, should scare you. And when you think about the conversion of agnostics or the conversion of atheists, or maybe the conversion of some of your children who aren't going to church anymore, remember that the one thing you can do to convince them of the reality of God is to act like Jesus, to love like Jesus, to be like Jesus. So how does this idea of our doing works, how does this connect with everything we said about Christ being the way? Because, think about it, if Jesus is the only way to have access to God, and we are, in a very real way, Christ's body, then it is through us that people have access to God. It is through our prayers. It is through our readings of scripture. It is through our sacraments, like baptism and communion. It is through our love, through our self-sacrifice. Yes, the church, we become the place in which people are saved. In Latin, there was a church tradition, a, a phrase that was extra ecclesiam nulla salus, and it meant there is no salvation outside the church. Now, that is not to say I don't think that God is not capable of saving people outside the church, but it does mean this. It means that the church is the primary means through which God draws people to him. We are the instrument that God uses to save the world. That is a huge responsibility and nothing to take lightly. Now, this is of course a very biblical theme, something that stretched back way into the Old Testament. You know what I mean? God chooses Abraham, why? to be a father of many nations, to bless the world. God chooses Israel, why? To be his chosen people, not so they could keep everything to themselves and have this special relationship with God that they wouldn't share with others, no, but to go out and to be a light, 
that attracts the world and brings everyone to God. And think about, this, this is interesting, think about what a priest's job was in the Bible. A priest was the one who mediated a relationship between a human and God. You know, the way they would do the sacrifices by slaughtering the animal and stacking its body parts a certain way and eating some of it and sharing some of it with the priest and letting its aroma be a pleasing aroma to God. The reason that the priest was there was to mediate the relationship between people and God. Only when sacrifices were done in the right way could someone uh, maintain their friendship with God. Now here's why I, I talk about priests, because what does the New Testament say? That we are all called to be priests. In First Peter we read, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own people, in order that you may proclaim the mighty acts of him who called you out of darkness into marvelous light. So as we, as we wrap up, you know that really bold claim that Jesus made about himself being the way, the truth, and the life? We get to make the same bold claim about ourselves. So guys, you have the highest calling imaginable. You have the highest calling imaginable. You have the highest calling imaginable. You have the highest calling imaginable in your life. We all do. That calling to be a mediator between people and God. That is what we mean when we talk about the priesthood of all believers. All of us have, in a sense, been called to be mini Jesuses reaching out, drawing people into this relationship with the real Christ so others can have a share in the divine life. And finally, one thing struck me which I never thought about before, but you know when you read the book of Acts, which is the, how the church was born? You know what Christianity was called before it was called Christianity? It was called, I think I heard a couple of people say it, that's right, it was called the way. Now can you see why? Because if Christ himself is the way, the truth, and the life, then we, his mystical body, become the exact same thing for others. So friends, may we accept this highest of callings to work with our Father, in the salvation of humanity. As a beautiful body with Christ as our head, may we be the way, the truth, and the life that leads all people to God. Amen.